Uh oh, guess what day it is? Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Talking Whatever Wednesday. I'm your host, alias Chuck Finley. I'm so glad you're listening today. Uh, let me drop the pluggables. You can follow the show at TWWPod1. Uh, check it out at Facebook.com slash Talking Whatever Wednesday. Feel free to give it five stars on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. Uh, currently, it's on Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. If you have any questions or comments, email me at talkingwhateverwednesday at gmail.com. Let's talk some more about prisons. Now, prisons in various forms have been a part of society since before history. And since people that go to prison tend to not want to be there, inevitably, there will be people who try to escape from prison. So that's what this hashtag evergreen episode is about. Uh, 1938 on May 22nd of 1938 during the Spanish Civil War 30 prisoners organized a mutiny for a massive prison break from Fort San Cristobal Fort San Cristobal is located on the top of the mountain San Cristobal which is about four kilometers from Pamplona Spain uh, built inside the mountain it served as a prison despite the fact that it had been obsolete since its opening in 1919 due to its weakness against aviation 792 prisoners fled, but only three succeeded in getting to the French border. 585 were arrested, 211 died, and 14 of the arrested, who were considered the leaders, were sentenced to death. Most fugitives were intercepted during the following days. Um, in 1988, a sculpture was erected to honor the memory of the prisoners who died there. The fort ceased to be a prison in 1945. Uh, let's see, Codlitz Castle was an, another escape-proof prisoner of war camp during World War II. But over the course of 300 escape attempts, 100 prisoners escaped. Sorry, 130 prisoners escaped. 30 escapees eventually managed to reach friendly territory. The men had tunneled, disguised themselves as guards, workmen, or women, sneaked away through sewer drains, and even built a glider in a plan to get over the wall. That right there is some MacGyver shit. Uh, I really did see an episode where MacGyver did exactly that. It was freaking awesome. I miss the 80s. Um, April 1943, Andre de Vigny, a French resistance fighter during World War II, escaped Montluc Military Prison, which was considered escape-proof, in Lyon, France, with his cellmate. De Vigny had discovered a way to remove his handcuffs with a safety pin. He ground the end of a spoon to a point on his cell's concrete floor and used it to remove the wooden slats near the bottom of the cell door and squeeze through the opening. At night, he was able to leave the cell and speak with other prisoners. And then, be, on, and then, on the night between August 24th and 25th, when conditions were uh, optimal for escape, he and his new cellmate climbed out of a skylight using a rope made from a blanket and a mattress cover and a grappling hook fashioned from the frame of an old lantern. And they made their way across the roof and descended to the courtyard. Divining threw a sentry to the ground and stabbed him with his own bayonet. To be clear, that sentry was a Nazi, so nobody should feel bad, feel bad about that. Ever. The two inmates climbed an inner perimeter wall, and after a guard patrolling the perimeter on a bicycle had passed by, uh, they flung the end of the rope with a grappling hook across a 15-foot gap to the outer wall, they swung across the gap on the rope and leapt to the ground, gaining the freedom of the streets. 
Devine eluded German search patrols and fled to Switzerland with the help of comrades in the resistance. Good for you, sir. You even killed a Nazi on your way out. Good job. Um, actually, next up would be what's called the Great Escape, but there's so much to do on that. I'm going to do an entire episode on that by itself. It's an awesome story. So I'll skip that for now and jump to August 5th, 1944, the Cower Breakout, where 1,104 Japanese POWs escaped, attempted to escape from a POW camp near Cowra in New South Wales, Australia. It was the largest prison escape of WW2, as well as the bloodiest. During the escape and, and ensuing manhunt, four Australian soldiers and 231 Japanese soldiers were killed. The remaining escapees were recaptured and imprisoned. Um, about, <clears throat> excuse me, situated about 195 miles due west of Sydney, uh, the town was Cowra was the town nearest to Number 12 Prisoner of War Compound, a major POW camp where 4,000 Axis military personnel and civilians were detained through World War II. The prisoners at Cowra also included 2,000 Italians, Koreans, and Taiwanese who had served in the Japanese military, as well as Indonesian civilians, detained at the request of the Dutch East Indies government. By August 1944, there were 2,223 Japanese POWs in Australia, including 544 merchant seamen. Yeah, <laughs> giggity. There were also 14,720 Italian prisoners, the majority of whom had been captured in the North African campaign, as well as 1,585 Germans, most of whom were captured naval or merchant seamen. Giggity. Although the POWs were treated in accordance with the 1929 Geneva Convention, relations between the Japanese POWs and the guards were poor, due largely to significant cultural differences. Which, yeah, that kind of makes sense. A riot by Japanese POWs at Featherstone Prisoner of War Camp in New Zealand in February of that year led to security being tightened at Kaura. Eventually, the authorities installed several Vickers and Lewis machine guns to augment the rifles carried by members of the Australian militia's 22nd Garrison Battalion, which was mostly, which was composed mostly of old or disabled veterans or young men considered physically unfit for frontline service. So, me. <laughs> In the first week of 1944, a tip-off from an informer, said to be a Korean informant, at Kaura led authorities to plan a move of all Japanese POWs at Kaura, except officers and NCOs, to another camp at Hay, New South Wales, uh, about 250 miles to the east, sorry, to the west, uh, about 400 kilometers. The Japanese were notified of the move on the 4th of August. In the words of historian Gavin Long the following night, at about 2 a.m. the Japanese ran to the camp gates and shouted what seemed to be a warning to the sentries. Then a Japanese bugle sounded, a sentry fired a warning shot, more, century, more sentries fired as three mobs of prisoners shouting Banzai began breaking through the wire. One mob to the northern side, one to the western, and one to the southern. They flung themselves across the wire with the help of blankets. They were armed with knives, baseball bats, clubs studded with nails and hooks, wire stilettos, and garroting cords. Holy shit. The bugler. Hajime Toyoshima had been Australia's first Japanese POW. I think he got his in the end. Soon afterwards, prisoners set most of the buildings in the Japanese compound on fire. Within minutes of the start of the first attempt, Privates Ben Hardy and Ralph Jones manned the number two Vickers machine gun and began firing into the first wave of escapees. They were soon overwhelmed by a series of... <coughs> excuse me. They were soon overwhelmed by a wave of Japanese prisoners who had breached the lines of barbed wire fences. Before dying, Private Harvey managed to remove and throw away the gun's bolt, rendering the gun useless. This prevented the prisoners from turning the machine gun against the guards. Some 359 POWs escaped, while some others attempted or committed suicide, or were killed by their countrymen. That's nice. Some of those who did escape also committed suicide to avoid recapture. All the survivors were recaptured within 10 days of their breakout. Uh, during the escape and... I'm sorry, am I irritating you? 
No? Good. During the escape and subsequent roundup of POWs, four Australian soldiers and 231 Japanese soldiers were killed and 108 prisoners were wounded. The leaders of the breakout or ordered the escapees not to attack the Australian civilians and none were killed or injured. Okay. The government conducted an official inquiry into the events. Its conclusions were read to the Australian House of Representatives by Minister John Curtin on September 8, 1944. Among the findings were conditions at the camp were in accordance with the Geneva Conventions. No complaints regarding treatment have been made on or behalf by on sorry have been made by or on behalf of the Japanese before the incident, which appear to have been the result of a premeditated and concerted plan. The actions of the Australian garrison in resisting the attack averted a greater loss of life, and firing ceased as soon as they regained control. Many of the dead had committed suicide or had been killed by other prisoners, and many of the Japanese wounded had suffered self-inflicted wounds. Privates Hardy and Jones were posthumously awarded the George Cross as a result of their actions. Graves of the Japanese War Cemetery in Kaura, many of those on the side nearest the camera, are for people killed in the breakout. A fifth Australian, Thomas Roy Hancock of C Company 26 Battalion, was accidentally shot by another volunteer while dismounting from a vehicle in the process of, de of deploying to protect the railways and bridges from the escapees. Hancock later died of sepsis. Oh, that's not good. Australia continued to operate number 12 camp until the last Japanese and Italian prisoners were repatriated in 1947. In the Great Papago Escape, over 25 German POWs escaped by tunneling, tunneling out of Camp Papago Park POW facility near Phoenix, Arizona on the night of December 23, 1944. They then fled into the surrounding desert, but because the rivers in Arizona were mostly dry and had not been you know, navigatable for decades, most of them were recaptured without bloodshed over the next few weeks. Good for them. In the Acre prison break, 28 members of the Jewish underground groups Ergun and Lehi escaped from the Acre prison in Acre Mandatory, Palestine on May 4, 1947. Um, well, 12 members of the same groups escaped from the central prison, uh, which is which today is the Muse Museum of Underground Prisoners in Jerusalem on February 20th, 1948. So those two groups were pretty active in getting their people out of prison. Cool. Nothing really exciting about those last two ones. That's kind of disappointing. Well, that actually takes us out of the 1940s. The next ones will be on to the 1950s and the 70s. I don't skip the 60s, don't worry, don't worry about that. But we're getting some more exciting ones, uh, including one guy who was a suspected, uh, who was suspected of being D.B. Cooper. Um, all those in some future episodes. Uh, they get better. Trust me, this list is insane and by far incomplete. So thanks for listening. I hope this was uh, at least a little, bit, a, little, uh, a little bit more fun than uh, the last episode. So, uh, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Thanks a lot.